Hello and welcome to a new video series where we're going to take a look at the design, construction, and building of the ultimate DIY smart home. Now the use of the word ultimate may be a little questionable. There are lots and lots of cool houses built every year all around the world. Uh, the DIY part though I think is the most interesting part of this video series. Uh, when you build a house, and particularly try to build what you might call a smart house, many people will use a contractor or a system integrator, or system designer, to help them pick out things and design the system, as well as install and configure, and in many times debug that system. Uh, and many houses are built using people like that and people that specialize in each different area, whether it be audio or video or uh, network or security. And the goal in building this house was to take a shot at doing as much of that work as possible myself. Now, that isn't, there are some parts of it that are a little harder to do by yourself, but during the process of building and designing and actually implementing, I did discover that there are a lot of things you can do um, if you're willing to put in some effort to both learn how the technology works and how you can deploy the technology. Um, there are a lot of great like home automation systems, like Control 4 is a good example. Uh, you can have someone install a Control 4 system and it can do a ton of integrations. And as a company, they're constantly adding new integrations, so they're constantly adding things to, to connect to other devices, plus upgrading and fixing devices. Uh, but with Control 4, you typically have to have a dealer who is gonna sort of configure and own your system. And then when you need to make a change to it, you might call them and they come and make the change for you. Uh, and that model works for many people. In fact, it's probably the preferred model for most people. Uh, for me, you know, as a CTO, I think it would be a little embarrassing if I have to call someone else to fix my tech house. So I embarked on this journey of trying to design and build and do as much DIY uh, as I could. It isn't always possible. There are some things that are more difficult to do, but uh, we made a pretty good effort. And so in this video series, we're gonna talk all about that. Um, this is a retrospective video series because I'm sitting in the house right now, so it is completed. Uh, and there's one great thing about being retrospective, and that is that along the process of showing you how things were designed and how decisions were made, and then eventually they were executed, it'll be easy for me to highlight the areas where that didn't quite go as planned, uh, areas where I made mistakes or, or didn't think of something. And so as a benefit, you get to see both the best and what could have been the best of all the decisions we made. And so hopefully that'll be helpful if you're thinking that you want to embark on building a house and doing your own uh, technology. I think for me, the key was that I knew that I had to want to learn things along the way. And in general, that's a practice in life that is uh, will, will serve you well. I work on cars a lot as a hobby. And you know, many years ago, if I wanted to have something done, I had to take it to a friend of mine to have them weld it. And then I decided, well, I should just learn to weld. So I learned to do MIG and TIG welding. And learning those skills, they really opens up the opportunities for what you can do. Um, and so I really encourage that if you're gonna try this, to try to view each different new thing as an opportunity to uh, learn. So when you wanna build a house, you of course need a place to build said house. And so you need a lot to build it on. And in this particular case, the lot that we chose to build on was an interesting lot. And we'll look at it in Google Earth here in just a little bit. Uh, it was a lot that was part of an area called Forest Park, which is a relatively large 5,000 acre forested area uh, here in Oregon. And these particular lots were somewhat unusual in that they were designated for potential residential building back in the late 90s, but with some very significant restrictions. They were broken up into lots and the lots themselves were in general between I think seven and 20 acres in size. They were all fully forested lots, so they were covered in trees. Uh, and they generally had a smaller area on the lot that was allowed for development. Uh, in the case of our lot, it's an 18 acre lot and about three acres were designated for potential building. Uh, and those are the only parts of the land you can actually make any changes on. So removal of trees and building can only happen within that three acre area. And then on top of that size restriction, there were a bunch of other restrictions. The lots themselves are part of an overlay for both conservation and environmental. And that means a couple of things, things like uh, removing trees is very uh, difficult. You have to get permits for removing any tree over six inches in size. Any tree larger than 30 inches is very difficult to remove. I think you end up paying $1,000 an inch in a fee to remove them plus the approval to do it. Uh, and for any tree you remove, you have to do what's called mitigation, which is for every tree we remove, we had to plant between five and 10 
additional trees on the property. Uh, and so that kind of dictates into how much you can remove in the area that you're building in. Uh, on top of that, there are lots of other environmental overlays, uh, things you can do and not do. Probably the biggest one that impacted getting started was that because it's in a watershed, you're not allowed to move dirt between October and April, which means that if you started moving dirt, you had to make sure you got all of it done before the October deadline, else you would be paused for six months until that moratorium comes back around again. Uh, and that's primarily because it's raining here a tremendous amount in the months from October to April, and they didn't want it to, to wash away dirt and create landslide risk. And so that created some challenges in getting permitting done and having it done in time to get started on things like the foundation, which obviously requires um, a great deal of dirt moving. So uh, we'll start by taking a look in Google Earth at what the lot looks like, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the history of building on it, uh, and then start the process of getting a house designed. So here we have a view from Google Earth of the lot that we were going to build in, and this is using Google Earth's feature where you can go back in time. So this is in 2018, uh, and the lot is basically this forested area here. And at the very center of the lot is the actual building site, which is this little outline here. And you can see from looking at it that it's kind of at the peak of a hill with a little bit of ravines on both sides. There are creeks in those ravines that have water, uh, that runs down toward the Columbia River. Uh, and actually you can see Mount Hood there and Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams there. Uh, and so there's a driveway that comes in here and kind of winds down through the trees. And the lot itself is actually right in the middle of the lot. So it's almost precisely in the middle of the lot. So you're surrounded on all sides uh, by trees, which is great because it really obstructs, you can't see any other houses or anything. Um, and it gives you a really private, quiet uh, area. Now, the most noticeable thing is it looks like something is here. And this lot has a somewhat interesting history, which is uh, it was owned by someone in the late 90s uh, who designed a house to build on it. And it was a very cool house. It was a concrete and glass house, uh, very modern. And it had a feature where it was cantilevered over both sides of those two hills. Uh, and so it's an unusual design, and it was uh, designed, and then in around 2006, the person that owned the lot just started the construction process for it, which included a tremendous amount of uh, work with architects and geotechnical engineers uh, and the city uh, in order to figure out how this could be built. And because it would be cantilevered, so there would be these wings sticking out over the hills, the foundation was going to be a little bit unusual, which is that you had a foundation that not only had compressive loads from the house sitting on it, but also lifting loads from these cantilevered arms. And so as part of that design and, and, and sort of getting prepped for building, uh, there were installed in the ground 55 of these pillars that went about 62 feet into the bedrock. They're about three feet in diameter of concrete and rebar. Uh, and they were spaced sort of in a grid around where the house would go. And you know, that's a tremendous amount of work to put those pillars in that far in, into the ground, huge drilling machine, um, tremendous amounts of concrete and rebar. It, it's probably a million dollars of work to put those, those uh, pillars in. Uh, and they formed the layout of where the foundation would eventually then be poured that really provided that uh, ability to have the, the cantilevered edges of the house. Um, so that happened. And then the person decided to stop building and put a pause on it. Uh, and that pause lasted until the person decided to sell the lot in 2017. So when we acquired the lot, it, it had this outline of where a house could go. And we can look here. Uh, you can see this sort of square shape here, along with the pillars that were in the ground uh, and a little bit of dirt that had been moved, but that's about it. The only other thing done was some tree clearing in the center spot here. And so, we bought the lot knowing that we had some restrictions on building. One was that that sort of was the building area and it dictated the house was gonna be a somewhat longer and narrower house. Um, and the pillars we were unsure of. And of course we weren't planning on building a cantilevered house. So it's likely they wouldn't be needed by us. Uh, they would just be extra things in the ground that the foundation would be attached to um, and maybe perhaps provide some resistance to uh, earthquakes. So. We, we embarked on, you know, after we bought the lot, we figured out, you know, the dimensions of what we could build for the house. 
um, what the restrictions would be, how it would lay out. As I mentioned, it ends up being sort of a narrower, longer house. Um, and the ground had also been, and you can't really tell it from, from this picture, um, but in the previous house, there's basically a pool back here. And so this part of the ground had been carved up and cut down quite a bit. So it was maybe eight feet or so farther down than the, than the, uh, the dirt above. And typically when you're doing a foundation for a big house especially, you, you want to be on native soil. So we knew we had this contour to deal with. And so that kind of played a little bit into how we structured and built the house. Um, there were other requirements. The lot does have uh, city water, but not city sewer. So we need a septic system, um, which in uh, Oregon in particular here requires what's called an advanced system. So it required two drain fields, a primary and a backup. And so we you know, were able to locate spaces in a kind of a flat area below the house where those drain fields could go. Um, and other than that, you know, we were at somewhat free reign to design whatever we think we could fit into this square area here. Um, we did end up removing a few trees, I think a couple of the trees here on the side here and two in the front, but it was a small number of removals overall. Um, and in part of that's because, you know, most of the trees were removed when the previous person had started doing the uh, building. So the lot was effectively, you know, it was ready to go in some ways. And once we had a foundation uh, design, it'd be pretty easy to start the construction process um, and eventually get a house built. And so in the next video, we're going to take a look at um, the how we approach designing the floor plan. And then from that, what sort of derived the way the house would look. And that had some surprising impacts on things like high voltage and low voltage and wiring and plumbing uh, based on how you decide to design things. So that'll be interesting to look at. Um, but I'm going to end this video by having a small little segment here that uh, shows what the property looked like in, over video um, when we first bought it. One good thing is, is during the construction process, I did a reasonable amount of drone photography. It's not fantastically uh, filmed, but it's, it's decent at least, uh, using a DJI drone. And in fact, I, could, I programmed in a flight path that sort of circled around the house. And you were able to recall that flight path and use it multiple times. Uh, and so that made for some somewhat consistent footage of the house being built. And so we'll use that throughout the series. So you can see what uh, was done and how was it done. And so with that, I'll let you head, this, head off this video about the uh, land. And in the next video, we'll get into the details of uh, how the house is going to come together.